We will call to order House Insurance Subcommittee. It is Tuesday, March 8th, the year 2022, shortly after 1.30 p.m. Uh, Ms. Beatty, would you please call the roll? Representatives Sapicki, Hicks, Here. Kumar, Here. Lafferty, Mitchell, Here. Rudder, here. Terry, Thompson, here. Chairman Hawk. I'm here. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. We do detect a quorum. We have a calendar before us today. It is titled the final calendar. Um, depending on how we go today, it is unlikely that we complete the calendar today. So uh, we will certainly try to work through as many pieces of legislation as we possibly can. Members, do we have any personal orders before any members before we begin? Seeing none, we will go right to our calendar, and uh, we do have some uh, some action that will, or, or lack of action, that may be occurring with some bills. We have folks presenting in other committees. Uh, we have some situations that are uh, uh, requiring individuals to be out of the building today as well, so we may... Uh, we may have some delays in some of the issues as they come before us. We do have before us uh, item number one on our calendar is House Bill 2008. The request has come from Speaker Pro Tem's Marsh, Marsh's office to roll that bill. And the uh, again, we cannot roll to another meeting because or to another calendar because we do not have another calendar. But we will roll that bill after item number 24 on your calendar without objection so ordered now we are up to item number two on our calendars it is house bill 1924 house bill 1924 speaker johnson you are recognized you have a motion and a second you're recognized uh, to explain the bill sir thank you mr chairman house bill 1924 renews the nursing home bed assessment, which expires on June the 30th of 2022. Uh, this assessment provides about one third of the revenue needed to fund nursing home reimbursements. Thank you. Before the question is called, uh, Speaker, is this your first bill? Question is called. <laughs> question is called. All those in favor of sending House Bill 1924 to full insurance committee, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Your bill Thank moves you, forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Committee. This is one of those situations where we're going to have to alter business just a little bit. Uh, item number three on our calendar. Chair Lady Hazelwood um, has asked that I sign on to that piece of legislation. And and I will turn the gavel over to Chairman Dr. Kumar. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, had, uh, we are on item number three on our calendar. Uh, House Bill 1985. Uh, Chairman Hawk, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and to the members, thank you for the motion. Thank you for the second. Um, this bill, much like the bill that uh, Speaker Johnson just, um, just carried, this is the annual uh, coverage assessment act for our hospitals. Uh, it's something that provides a substantial amount of uh, revenue through the 10 care system to our hospitals and uh, certainly stand for any questions that you all may have about it. Uh, Without objection. Thank you. And forgive me, Chairman. Um, we do have an amendment. Tracking code is um, 014418. We have a motion and second on amendment um, 014418 going on House Bill 1985. All those in fav favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment goes on the bill. The bill is amended and ready for the question that was called. Um, without objection, we are voting on House Bill 1985. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The bill passes and goes to full committee. Thank you. 
I guess everything was from Kamel. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your indulgence there. We are now on our calendar, item number four on our calendar. It is House Bill 2262 by Chairman Curcio. The request of Chairman Curcio has been to take that bill off notice. Without objection, the bill is off notice. We're now on item number five on our calendar. House Bill 1134 by Chairman Farmer. Motion. We have a motion. We have a second. Sir, you are recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. What this does, this raises the, the minimum limits, the minimum policy limits for uh, vehicle, vehicle property damage from 15,000 to 25,000. As we all know, parts have just went sky high. Used cars are as much as, as new cars, so I think it's time that, that we make this adjustment. Okay. You've heard the explanation of the legislation. Any questions or comments for this sponsor? Seeing not, the question has been called. All those in favor of sending House Bill 1134 by Chairman Farmer to full insurance committee, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any of those opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Your bill moves forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Thank you. Alright. We are now on item number six on our calendar. Item number six is House Bill 0988. Chairman Williams is currently uh, entertaining a group of Putnam County leadership folks from back home in the district, and he has asked that we roll House Bill 988 behind item number 24 on our calendar. Without objection, House Bill 988, item number six, is rolled behind item number 24 on our calendar. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now on item number seven on our calendar, House Bill 2347 by Chairman Boyd. Chairman Boyd, you are uh, recognized. Motion. We have a motion. We have a second. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 2347 is a request for, it's a study bill. We request for the Comptroller and the Tennessee Department of Health uh, and Tent Care to collaborate and produce a study of the effects of temporary staffing and staffing agency as it applies to long-term care facilities. As many of you know, staffing and health care in nearly all parts of the economy are in a difficult spot. The use of staffing agencies to care for patients uh, can potentially have many effects on the quality of care to patients as well as the cost of care to providers, uh, one of the biggest being the state of Tennessee through our TEN Care program. Mr. Chairman, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the explanation. Representative Thompson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can you tell me what this bill does? Does it uh, encourage less uh, 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 using less using temporary staff, or and how does it do this? Chairman Boyd, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It simply uh, puts together a study to look into it to see what the costs are. The staffing agency numbers have, have skyrocketed uh, tremendously and that they're just having to eat the cost right now and, and they're currently passing that along to Ten Care. So really, my understanding when they brought this to me was they just wanted the state to, to sit down all interested parties and kind of take a look at it and, and report back. Thank you very much. It's a good bill. I'm, I'm personally aware of, of um, instances in the home of um, of overuse of staffing and uh, and as you said, lack of quality is is a result. So thank you very much. Question on the bill. Thank you. Question has been called. Are you ready to vote? Uh, item number seven, House Bill twenty three forty seven. All those in favor of sig uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any of those opposed? Please please say no. The ayes have it. Your bill moves forward to full insurance committee. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Thank you. All right. All 
All right. We are now ready for item number eight on our calendar, House Bill 1751 by Chairman Whitson. The request from Chairman Whitson has been to take this bill off notice. Seeing no objection, House Bill 1751 is off notice. We are now ready for item number nine on our calendar. House Bill 1772 by Chairman Powers. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I roll this one spot and do the, uh, I've got nine and 10. Can I roll this one spot and do number, number 10 first, please? Certainly. The request has been to roll House Bill 1772 one spot. We will acquiesce to that and we will recognize without objection. We will now go to House, excuse me, item number 10 on the calendar, House Bill 2225 by Chairman Powers. You are recognized on House Bill 2225. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. I believe we do have an amendment on we, the legislation. We do. It's uh, amendment number 014844. Motion. We have a motion and a second. Uh, if it's at the will of the subcommittee, we'll go ahead and put the amendment on the bill and, uh, and discuss it as, as amended. Without objection. All those in favor of placing House Amendment Tracking Code 014844 on the bill, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any of those opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. We are on House Bill 2225 as amended. Chairman Powers, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, House Bill 2225 changes the current law so that the commissioner will not consider a prior misdemeanor or a Class E felony, and that's only if the individual was charged or not convicted, if either offense occurred more than 10 years before the date upon which an individual would submit an application for a license. Right now, they go back. There's actually no time frame on it. If you've had a misdemeanor 20 years ago, um, it could be counted against you and could knock you out of getting a producer license in the insurance business. And uh, the Class E felony, um, and I'm sure there's, there's some lawyers on here too that know about that, it's only if it's charged and not convicted. A Class E felony could be a minor thing. Uh, for example, a vandalism of a building, if it's $900, it's a misdemeanor. If it's $1,100, it's a Class E felony. So if they've been charged with a Class E felony but not convicted, because right now that will knock them out of getting a producer license also. Uh, everybody has a past. We've all done some stupid things, and I don't want to take up your time and uh, tell you all of mine, or it would take too long. But if they've not had any activity with uh, law enforcement within past years, we have to sh assume that they probably uh, got a stable and, and, they, and they deserve to uh, get a job. As an insurance agency owner, I understand how difficult it is to find qualified applicants. This will help all agencies to hire someone who is qualified made a mistake a long time ago and deserves a second chance. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I renew my motion. Thank you for the explanation, Chairman Powers. Any questions or comments for the sponsor? Dr. Kumar, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Powers. You are a forgiving soul. <laughs> but uh, one feels concerned sure. with uh, if there is a... So it's limited up to uh, Class E felony. Yes, not uh, only only class A. Yeah, that that could be some minor things there, too. but Why only if they're charged. If they've charged right now and not convicted, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. If if they're charged right now and not convicted, they would still be knocked out of a license. But this says if they've been uh, charged. I'm sorry. If they if they've been charged at all and not convicted, if they've been acquitted, then they would still be eligible. Dr. Kuba, are you recognized? So they are. They were charged with this, but acquitted, okay, so they were cleared in that right. sense. Exactly. What is a Class E felony? Well, just like I mentioned a while ago, it, it's some minor things, and there's some more major things, too. Uh, but like I was talking about vandalism of a building, if it was $900, it's a misdemeanor. If it's $1,100, it's a Class E felony. And there's some other things like that that go along with it, but... A lot of them will, would be some financial things, too, that if they had been charged with that. Um, but there's a whole list of, of Class E felonies, but that's the, the lowest grade of any kind of felony, but only if they've been charged but never convicted of anything. Well, Dr. Kumar, you're recognized. Well, thank you. 
I see, so it is, it's uh, maybe considered for the purpose and there is a board that decides that? Yes, I mean, yeah, they would, they would still have to go get approved, run a background check, everything would still be like it is today. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. And it, Thank you. Any further comments, Chairman uh, Powers? No, no, just I'll renew my motion. Okay. Are you ready to vote? All those in favor of sending House Bill 2225 to full insurance committee, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any of those opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Your bill moves forward. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are jumping back to item number nine on our calendar, uh, House Bill 1772. Chairman Powers, you are recognized. Okay. Excuse this me. This one has an amendment uh, on it, too. Motion, second. We have a motion on the bill. Uh, we have a motion on House Bill 1772. Thank you. Amendment code number is 014845. Is that accurate? Correct. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and place... I'm sorry. Uh, we have a motion on amendment 014845. Do we have a second? Second. second. We have a second. Looking at the amendment, sir, that will rewrite the bill. Uh, we'll go ahead Correct. and put the amendment on the bill to have the discussion on the full bill. All those in favor of placing amendment 014845 on House Bill 1772, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any of those opposed, please say no. The amendment is on the bill. Sir, you are recognized as on the bill as amended. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, House Bill 1772, it just clarifies the licensing requirements for individuals that are, that are marketing Medicare products, such as Medicare Advantage or Medicare Part D. It makes no change to the current law and simply codifies the current practice. It clarifies that licensing of a Medicare marketing representative is governed by federal regulations without any additional state regulation. And marketing in our industry uh, is simply educational and informational. It's not trying to sell a product. Um, that's where the CMS, they differentiate between selling and marketing. And for marketing representatives, they do not sell the product. And CMS requires them to be federally licensed for marketing activities as well as state licensed right now for, for selling. So they would still have to go through the CMS certification just like they currently will do. And then uh, if if that changes later on, if, if CMS changes, then, then this would change along with it. And with that, I renew my motion and be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. You've heard the explanation. Are you ready to vote? All those in favor of sending House Bill 1772 to full insurance committee, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any of those opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Your bill moves forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, item number 11 on our calendar is up next, House Bill 2048. This is another bill, we, we, bill we are going to roll, uh, roll behind item number 24. And I will say we're going sequentially as these bills are being rolled. Um, with no objection, item number 11, House Bill 2048 will be rolled after item number 24 on our calendar. We are now on item number 12 on our calendar. House Bill 2469, and I'm given a note that the request is to take House Bill 2469 off notice without objection. House Bill 2469 is off notice. We are now on item number 13 on our calendar, House Bill 2625. I have a little smile on my face as we're going through this. House Bill 2625, item number 13, will be rolled behind item number 24 on our calendar without objection. That bill is rolled.
We are now ready for item number 14 on our calendar. House Bill 2425 by Representative Sparks. Any guesses as to what's about to happen with this piece of legislation? <laughs> it's a good guess, but you do not win the prize. <laughs> item number 14, House Bill 2456 will be rolled behind item number 25 on our calendar without objection. Correction, uh, misstated on that on that particular motion. If I can take back that gavel being hit. Um, item number 14 on the calendar, House Bill 2456, will be rolled behind item number 24 on our calendar. No one objected to my earlier mistake, so no one objects to my correction of the mistake. So without without objection. We are now on item number 15 on our calendar. House Bill 2302, the request of the sponsor has been to take this bill off notice. House Bill 2302 is off notice without objection. We are now on House Bill 2840, item number 16 by Leader Camper. Leader Camper, you are recognized. Thank Do we you, have Mr. Chairman. Members. Listening for listening for a motion. We have a motion and a second. Leader Camper, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members, House Bill 2840 is a bill that not only looks to save money and save lives, but also help helps to get patients the care that they need. And I, I'm proud to say this is a bipartisan bill and uh, from one of my co-sponsors, including um, Leader Gant. This legislation is based on a program currently being used by the Memphis EMS that makes sure that those who need mental health care are taken to the place that best address their needs. This bill would also allow for issues that can be best addressed by a non-emergency care facility and they will be covered. And Mr. Spe Mr. Rep uh, Chairman, uh, speaking of EMS, we have a, a person here that I'd like to testify. Mr. Um, Kevin from uh, Memphis EMS is here, and I'd like for him to be able to testify on this bill. Thank you. We do have Lieutenant Kevin Spratlin from the Memphis Fire Department EMS. Uh, Lieutenant Spratlin, are you in the office? Or excuse me. <laughs> In the committee room, yes, sir. if you could please come to uh, come to the table, find you a comfortable seat. If you could uh, punch the button in front of you to the microphone, make sure the red light comes on. Yes, sir. and as you testify, uh, uh, we will go out of session without objection. <laughs> Lieutenant Spradlin, if you could tell us who you are and who you're with, and tell us what you like. We do have three minutes for testimony. We'll be able to engage you in rejoinder comments uh, for much longer than that if, if we go beyond that. So, sir, you're recognized. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Again, my name is Kevin Spratlin um, with Memphis Fire Department. We are a large EMS agency providing uh, medical care to the citizens of Memphis. We have, over the last several years, uh, been uh, deploying a model that is uh, what we call the right response. This is our ability to find the most appropriate resource for the needs of our community because as you well know, there are many, many people who call 911 with issues that are not life-threatening emergencies. And currently in traditional EMS, the only way that an EMS agency is reimbursed is if we put them in the back of an ambulance and we transport them to the ER, even if something else is more appropriate for their care. Even if we're able to fix the issue on the scene, if we're able to uh, get them transported to a, a clinic such as a behavioral setting or an urgent care center or a primary care uh, clinic, even if we're able to connect them with that primary care provider so that they can get more appropriate care that is better for their long-term outcomes and much cheaper for the healthcare system, we are perversely incentivized to only transport to the ER because that is the only way that we are, are paid. Medicare, CMS has seen that differently. Uh, Memphis Fire Department is one of three sites in Tennessee that was chosen for ET3, which is Emergency Triage, Treat, and Transport. It is for Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries, and what CMS has said is, 
we will pay you to either continue transporting to the ER as normal or to transport to an alternate destination, such as a behavioral health setting or a primary care clinic, or to treat in place and have that person cleared by a qualified health professional, such as a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant, whether they be live on scene or via telehealth. We have been safely and successfully and effectively doing this in Memphis now for over two years and have proven the model and have been quite beneficial to our system to be able to keep people who don't need an ER visit out of the ER, therefore making sure those ER beds are available for higher level events and saving money for the system. We're coming to you today to consider uh, asking TenCare to extend that to TenCare beneficiaries because we have found in our data that there are a significant number of TenCare beneficiaries who call 911 for non-life-threatening events and need help being navigated to a more appropriate setting, better for their needs and at a lower cost. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments for our presenter? If you could, Lieutenant Spradlin, how prevalent is this issue? If you could tell me uh, the, the calls that occur and happen as the way you have explained them. Can you give me a prevalence? And I don't know if you can drill down into a percentage or not, but if, if you could, that would be very helpful. You're recognized. Thank you, sir. Uh, we absolutely uh, look at our data and uh, recognize that at the time of dispatch, uh, around 25%, nearly 25% of all of our calls are non-life threatening. So at dispatch, we don't even respond lights and sirens because the chief complaint that is described over the 911 call is of such low acuity that it doesn't require that. We know that additionally, when many of our providers arrive on scene afterwards, they find that it's not a life-threatening event and that patient can be handled in some other ways. However, we are incentivized to only go to the ER. So to get into the data, last year we made approximately 140,000 uh, EMS calls in the city of Memphis. Keep in mind, that's not the rest of Shelby County, so that's just Memphis Fire, a very busy agency. In the normal ambulance service payer mix, about 27% of those payers are uh, uh, TenCare, Medicaid. Um, when we look at the low acuity calls, nearly 50% of the calls that are non-life threatening are TenCare beneficiaries. That is a significant number. In the model that I run, which is the healthcare navigator, uh, where we send out a team in an SUV that has a physician, a specially trained paramedic, and a resource navigator working as a social worker, we are able to navigate greater than 80% of those persons away from ambulance transport and 60 to 65% of them do not end up in an ER. I will tell you uh, forthrightly during COVID, we've been a little less successful in getting people into clinics because of uh, availability of clinic uh, appointments during COVID, though that is getting better. But greater than 60% of the people we see do not end up in the ER and over 80% do not end up on an ambulance. Thank you. Chairman Kumar, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for making the trip. Um, seems logical, and I think um, I would be supportive of the effort. Um, I don't know if this question is for you or for Leader Camper, but uh, it seems that we will save money by doing this, yes. but yet there is a positive fiscal note on it. Leader, uh, I can address it if you'd like. Um, um, just a moment. So. I think we'll we'll go to the to the uh, gentleman testifying first, and we may come back. Um, that may be a question for Tink here as well, uh, Chairman Kumar, as as we uh, go. So, uh, Lieutenant Spradlin, I'll recognize you for your thoughts on that question. Uh, we would love to have a discussion with Tink here about that fiscal note. I have significant questions over how it was calculated. Uh, we have our own numbers, and we have numbers from CMS that do not lead to the same conclusion, so we would welcome the opportunity to have a discussion with Tent Care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Chairman Dr. Terry, you're recognized. Thank you. Is uh, Tent Care going to testify after this? We do have them on the list as available for questions, so uh, if... Uh, I'll, I'll withhold mine until they come up. Okay. Thank you. More questions or comments for our presenter? Representative Mitchell, you're recognized. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. And if, you know, Memphis is anything like the Nashville Fire Department, I mean, we'll have concerned citizens. They'll see the homeless gentleman, mm -hmm. you know, either asleep or maybe totally intoxicated on the bench. Yes. And 
you know, you guys have to show up, and most of the time you have to transport them yes, to the emergency room instead of, hey, if they're out in the cold or something, yes, you, you transport them to the shelter or, you know, or, you know, like you said, social service agency is mm -hmm. with you. I mean, this is definitely cost savings. Yes, sir. I mean, I don't know where TenCare could calculate it. It's going to cost, but... You know, if it does cost, we're going to pull down more federal dollars anyway. So exactly. either way, it's cost savings. Thanks. Thank you. Seeing no further questions or comments, thank you, Lieutenant Spradlin, very thank much. You. We appreciate that. Appreciate we have had a request, and they are available for uh, questions and comments. Uh, individuals from TenCare. Um, whomever on the team would like to speak on this Legislation, please come forward. We all, we all know who you are, but if you could please tell us who you are, who you're with, and uh, and be prepared. Ashley Reed, Division of Ten Care. Um, so yes, I think where the you're seeing the cost come from is that I think the vendor that provides this service when they perform the triage, there's a, a fee for that. Um, so they're triaging, but then whether they're triaging, treating, or transporting, they're also paying that rate. Um, I'll also note Medicare rates are higher than Medicaid rates. So even with that, where you would see savings, the offset is less because those Medicare rates are higher than Medicaid rates. Jim and Hawk had to step out. So what causes increased expense is addition of the fee for triage. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, I think that answers the question. Um, Jim and Spicky? Uh, just for clarification, is, is there an RFP that goes out so we're not steering this to one vendor for the triage? I am not sure I could could answer that if it was passed and we were we were trying to implement it. I can certainly get back with you though on whether an RFP would be required. Follow up. Okay. You recognize? Would that be normal procedure from Ten Care if there is going to be a third party that's going to be billing Ten Care? Would there be an RFP go out for this? Yeah, and and actually it would be our MCOs that were that we're contracting with folks. Um, and I think they would probably look at, you know, different vendors that are in this space and then, and then work with them on their own. But I will confirm. Thank you. Jim and Terry, you recognize? Uh, thank you. And I was looking at the uh, CMS website and it says it's a voluntary five-year payment model. Is that, uh, what's the, uh, what's the status of that becoming permanent or what's sure. the, What's the status of that right now? We can check with CMS on where they are um, in that pilot and if they plan to make it recurring. Okay. You recognize? Um, and then it's it's triage, treat, and transport. And so I guess um, what would prevent someone from calling an ambulance just to come triage and treat them at their home if they're not actually going to? transport them somewhere or basically doing a mobile office I'm not Go ahead. I'm not sure what would prevent them from doing that as you know there are no copays or premiums within that program um, so I'm not sure what would actually prevent a member from from calling that but I think that's probably the goal of the program is they would triage that and then learn whether that person could be treated via a telehealth visit where whether it was an actual emergent or non-emergent situation whether it could go to an urgent care. Jim and Terry. Thank you. So um, I'm, so I'm just trying to <laughs> digest what all this is. So if somebody calls and they come there to the house and say they just wanted them to take them to their doctor's appointment or something like that, which I would consider probably abuse of what this is supposed to be, what would occur in that situation? I mean, would they say, you know, I've got, you know, my diabetes is, is up, you know, sugar's up, I've got an appointment, and then they, well, I mean, what, 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 what prevents that? Yeah, and I may actually ask um, the gentleman if he, if he knows what, what the process would be 
if somebody did that. I mean, that that to me, that sounds like a, a triage incident. Um, and I would have to check on what kind of reimbursement would be allowable if somebody was just, you know, calling to you know, have a conversation if there wasn't actually okay. an emergent or non-emergent episode. All right. Thank you. I'm just, my mind's sure. just <laughs> kind of racing a little bit here. Thank you. Any other questions? I think the goal of the program still holds and appears to be well, uh, but there are questions about it. Um, if there are no other questions, and uh, does do you need to make a statement? No, no, okay. no, we don't have okay. any. I'm asking the. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, then we'll go ahead and let him come back and maybe answer s some of your questions. Um, Lieutenant Spratlin. Thank you again. One thing I'd like to clarify is under ET3, there is no reimbursement for the triage piece, period. Triage is done currently through the 911 system. When you call 911, a, an emergency medical dispatcher asks a series of scripted questions, and a physician has predetermined the response configuration for those calls. So we're not being reimbursed for that now, and we're not seeking reimbursement. For Therefore, that piece of the fiscal note we feel is incorrect, and that is a significant part of the note. The way the calls are triaged is our medical director has said, this type of call is appropriate for this type of outcome, and then gives us clinical guidelines as paramedics on how to proceed. Therefore, we are not seeking reimbursement for the triage piece, as is stated in the fiscal note. What we are asking is that when we successfully treat a person on scene that does not require emergent transport to an ER, we would like to be reimbursed for that, and there would be a physician reimbursement piece there so that that uh, care can be handled safely and efficaciously, and we would also like to be able to reimburse to an alternate destination. I can speak to the model we've built in Memphis. We have no desire to transport someone to a doctor's office or to a clinic. However, we do wish to transport behavioral health patients to a behavioral health setting. If I may, I'll use that as a quick example, though please be clear, this is not purely a behavioral health bill. When we have a behavioral health patient in crisis, the very best place for them to be is in a crisis center, which we have in Memphis. However, what we end up doing is we transport that person by ambulance to the ER. The facility then charges you for that and then charges for the physician to review that patient, then pays for mobile crisis to come and see that patient for the mobile crisis assessor to say, you just need to go back to the crisis center. And then they call for another ambulance to take that patient to the crisis center. Whereas the model that, we're, uh, b that we have built and that we're asking you to support allows us to go straight there. It's better for the patient, it's better for the system, and it's far less expensive. So again, I'd like to dispute the triage piece that's in the fiscal note. That is not correct, and we are not seeking that. Okay. Any questions? So, seeing none, thank you. Uh, thank you. We will work to resolve the other issues. We'll go back into the session. Uh, Leader Camper, uh, I guess you've heard the questions and the concern about uh, the resolution about what the fiscal note should be. Um, I I did, You're recognized. I did, Mr. Chairman, but I, I think he addressed the concerns that the members had. I believe that this this bill, if enacted, I think it would de decrease costs. I think it would encourage, uh, uh, discourage this um, this transport that's costing a lot of money and, and pressuring the overall healthcare system. So I think it gives them flexibility to be able to transport to a non-emergency mental health facility like he just mentioned, or to the ER if necessary. I think it uh, encouraging the higher frequency of treatment at the scene or via telehealth and, and having this as an alternative uh, is appropriate care for the person. And I think that is something that we can work through. If TenCare have a problem, I think we can work through, uh, you know, as it moves uh, to address their concerns. Uh, so I think it's a good bill. I think it'll help the overall health care system. Thank you. I think um, I agree with you that it makes sense uh, as far as patient care and use of resources is concerned. But it will be good if you would take time before it, it comes, if it gets to full committee and before it comes there, to have these issues resolved. That would be helpful. Uh, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I commit to that. Uh, you, you know, I think... Uh, sure. Uh, 
this committee has shown that they want, they, they appreciate what this bill is doing. They appreciate the benefits it's going to have to patient care, to health care system, to the emergency system. And I will surely work with 10th Care and any of you as we move forward. We move it to full committee. If it, you know, if there's still problems, I'll park it there and we'll move it and we'll just continue to work on it as it go forward. Members, any questions? Seeing none. Uh, are we ready to vote? We are voting on House Bill 2840. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The bill moves on to full committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members. We are on to item number 17, House Bill 2862 by Jim and Dixie. Do I have a motion? We have a motion and a second. Jim and Dixie, you're recognized. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And I think this is my first time appearing before this committee, and so thank you. And I heard that this was like the best committee, but I would have to argue a little bit. I'm on, on Chairman Sapicki's, one of his committees, but, <laughs> but thank you again. So I, I want to talk about the bill, though, but this is a good committee. Um, this bill has to do with continuous glucose monitors. And for I'll explain to what a continuous glucose monitor is at the expense of not making it too rudimentary. But basically, it's a device that continuously checks your glucose at a real-time real time rate. So what this bill would do is anybody that has insulin-dependent and you're on Medicaid, that you will be able to, your doctor will be able to ask for a uh, prescription for your for a continuous glucose monitor. I'm going to say CGM because keep saying continuous glucose monitor is pretty tough to say. And I just want to kind of tell you a quick story. Many of you know here that I am uh, a diabetic, and I'm pretty in tune with what well, I'm type two diabetic. But I'm pretty in tune with my body of what happens, and sometimes it gets out of whack. And about two and a half weeks ago. I told my wife I wasn't feeling well. I was like, I don't know what's going on with me. I, I, I just don't feel well. And sometimes I get cloudy. My head gets cloudy. It doesn't happen often because I'm very in tune with my body. And she said, well, have you checked your blood sugar? And I checked my blood sugar. I did the prick, got that, and I found out my blood sugar was really high. It was, it was like 225, which is really high for me. And, and I realized what was going on, so I got up and walked a little bit, tried to expend some of the the energy out for my body, and I laid back down, and I was okay. But if I had a continuous glucose monitor, it would have alerted me as it was getting higher and higher over time. Um, they have monitors that you can monitor over the time over your phone. There is a young, there's a young lady in this audience that lives in Columbus, Ohio. She has a daughter that has type 1 diabetes, and she has a continuous glucose monitor. And right now, she can look at her phone and tell you exactly what her daughter's blood sugar is right now, at this moment. And her daughter's in Columbus, Ohio. She has received alerts throughout the night that wakes her up to say, hey, your blood sugar's dropping too low. I need you to get some juice. Because what this bill does, it will allow people to build better, health, healthier habits as they move forward in life, because once you get diabetes, it's a debilitative disease. It never gets better. You just can only maintain it. And so what this bill would allow people to learn how to maintain their blood sugars, what, goes, what causes it to go up, what causes it down, and there's many, thing, many factors besides food that encourages that. So it could be stress. It could be whether you have a cold, if you have allergies. But this way, it will help you manage your diabetes. Um, I have a lot more I can say about this. But at this point, I will pause for any questions. Thank you, Chairman Dixon, very much. We do have an amendment on the bill that is being presented by one of our committee members. Uh, Chairman Kumar, you are presenting amendment code 014840, I believe. Yes, Thank you. Yes, you're recognized. Um, And we'll wait for a motion and a second on the amendment. Motion. We have a motion? We have a second. We are on uh, explanation of amendment 014840. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a friendly amendment acceptable to the sponsor of the bill. 
And what it does is it makes it so that gl continuous glucose monitoring will be made available to patients based on the criteria that are in place with the, the payers. All right. Thank you very much. You've heard the explanation of the amendment. All those in favor of placing the amendment on the bill, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any of those opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Chairman Dixie, you, that uh, the amendment did help your fiscal note considerably, and um, you're recognized if you'd like to give us the, the flavor of the bill now that the amendment is on. Yeah, so I want you to close your eyes and imagine that there is no fiscal note because I want you to focus on the merits of the bill. I want you to just only focus on the merits of the bill. There is an entire committee called Finance, Ways, and Means that will deal with this when it gets to their committee. And if you would allow them to do their jobs, I think that by the time we work there, we can find an amenable agreement. Tincare, we've worked together, we're talking, we're going back and forth. We do have some sticking points but I think that we can overcome them over time. But uh, basically, that's in, in, in a nutshell, that's what it is. And I think that we want to, my bill also will, will require them not to be durable medical equipment, which can take a little time for them to get there. Um, so this will require a pharmacist, a pharmacy benefit, which means your doctor could write you a script. And just to prove my point is that last Friday, no, Thursday, I called my doctor, I just called him and said, can you write me a script for a glucose monitor? He said, he, a couple hours later, he said, okay, go pick it up from the pharmacy. It was just that quick. But I was able to do that because I have private insurance. But if you're on Medicaid or you're poor, we're penalizing people because they're poor in the health benefit because they cannot do this. And if they are able to do it, they have to go through the DME uh, uh, vehicle to get this. And it can be a, a weeks, days, weeks in order before they can get that. So I just also want to throw that in there as well that we don't want to put the value of a life just because they have the inability to pay. Thank you very much for that. Representative Mitchell, you're recognized. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. How much, are the te how much do testing strips cost? Well, it depends. Like I say, I have private insurance, but I have, tested, I have the strips, I have the lancets, and I also have a machine that I do. And so it's a 30-day, normally come in 30-day supplies, and uh, it could anywhere be between $150, 100, $150. So that's monthly. Yes. How much is a glucose monitor? Uh, roughly $1,500. So, so in le less, way less than a year, uh, it's going to pay for itself. And, and it's, it's not only that. What happens is that once you teach people better habits, they don't have problems oh, It keeps on. them out of the emergency room. It keeps them out of the emergency rooms. It keeps them from getting things amputated. Because what happens when you pour and you go into a hospital and you have some vascular issues, the first thing they'll say is, let's cut it off. Let's cut your toe off. Let's cut your foot off. Instead of trying to figure out a remedy to how to save it. So if we can teach people better habits on the front end, it will save the state money on the back end from having to, do, from having to pay for that. Thank you. Any further questions or comments for the sponsor? I, ironically, I, I heard the Chairman of Budget sub clear his throat earlier as, uh, as you were talking about the fiscal note. So uh, there's more of that going on in the room as we speak now. Are you ready to vote? Question has been called. All those in favor of House Bill 2862, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. You are moving to full insurance committee. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Chairman Sophie. <laughs> Leader Camper, forgive us. You, uh, you had another bill on the calendar. We're now ready for item number 18 on our calendar, House Bill 1973. Leader Camper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, did the fiscal no eye closing Do have thing work, Do Mr. Uh, Chairman? Do you have a, <laughs> we're looking for a motion and a second on the legislation. <laughs> we we got one over here. <laughs> hey, we have we have a motion and a second on your legislation, Leader Camper. Please uh, please continue. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, I want to thank the committee for working with me and the staff on this bill. You know, it previously was uh, carried by Senator um, London Lamar, so I'm standing in in her, uh, the new senator, I should say, uh, London Lamar, standing in on her stead. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, House Bill 17, uh, 1973 is a remote patient monitoring bill, and it will create a pilot program. This bill will help create positive health outcomes for mothers and babies in Tennessee, makes a positive, make it possible to detect issues with the mother and baby before birth, and to reduce the number of emergency C-sections and preterm deliveries in our state. And Mr. Chairman, this isn't a piece of legislation where we're attempting to find an outcome. We have evidence from other states that have used this program to achieve better outcomes for mothers, babies, and our physicians. Today, Mr. Chairman, we have Mr. Evan Hoffman from the Phillips Corporation to testify on behalf of the technology and positive implications of implementing the programs in other states. Uh, we would like, would you care to hear from him, Mr. Chairman? I have him. members. Thank you, and we do have Mr. Evan Hoffman on the list. I, I will state this has been, this is a concept that we are about to begin year two of a pilot uh, that we have funded through 10 Care through the governor's budget, and we are in the process of, of doing this very thing, this very work. Uh, it's part of our shared savings plan that we passed last year uh, for Ten care that we were able to add programs, and this has been one that we have um, have been able to uh, to address. Forgive me, I think I may have overspoke there. Uh, I was I was ahead of myself with Leader Love, so I apologize. <laughs> Leader Love, when you come up, if you could just remember what I said, that was intended for you. Forgive me, committee. We do have, uh, have a gentleman who would like to speak on this, uh, Mr. Evan Hoffman, who is in the crowd as well. Uh, our folks from Ten Care may like to address this issue too. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, are you in the crowd? Yes. Yes, all right. We will go out of session without objection. Mr. Hoffman, if you could please uh, make sure the red button is on in front of you. Tell us who you are, who you're with, and talk a little bit about, uh, about your thoughts on the bill. Thank you, Chairman Hawk and members of the subcommittee. My name is Evan Hoffman. I am the Director of State Government Affairs for Philips. Uh, so Philips is a healthcare tech company um, focused exclusively on improving people's lives. We are a proud Tennessee employer with over 1,100 employees, including 800 right across the street at the Philips Plaza building here in Nashville. Um, we uh, work with hospitals also across the state uh, in all of your districts, most likely to help patient cares from West Tennessee Healthcare to Ballot Health. So today is International Women's Day, March 8th. So I think it's extremely fitting that we're talking about this bill today. Philips has a deep history in maternal health. We are the world's largest ultrasound company, the largest obstetrics monitoring company, and we are the owner of Pregnancy Plus, which is the world's most globally downloaded pregnancy app. This bill is important because it will unlock uh, maternal health care for moms who struggle to access this care otherwise, especially in rural Tennessee. So let me describe how this bill will work. I ask everyone to imagine that you're one of the 25% of moms who find themselves with a high-risk pregnancy. You are singularly focused on keeping yourself healthy and keeping your baby healthy. This may require visits to your doctor several times a week, especially during the third trimester. So keeping up with these appointments is challenging. So, so many moms face this impossible decision, especially if they live in rural areas. How do I access and keep up with all these appointments, but risk taking time off work or finding childcare or driving far to the doctor? And this is very true um, for the 210,000 women in Tennessee who live in so-called maternity deserts, maternity healthcare deserts, where some of this care is very hard to find. And these pregnancy risk factors really should not be ignored, and that's what this bill really tries to address. 
Uh, so diabetes, hypertension, two of the most common risk factors, they often lead, if untreated, to C-sections that are unplanned, um, to preterm births, to complications postpartum, both for mom and baby. And so that's what we're really trying to address with this bill. As mentioned, it would create a three-year 10-care pilot um, for moms to access this kind of remote monitoring in their home. So imagine if you're a doctor and you can get early warning alerts, kind of like a check engine light on your car. That's essentially what this bill would do. The data would flow from the mom who's doing remote monitoring through like a blood pressure cuff or a scale that's connected to the doctor. The data would then flow to the doctor. And if something is moving in the wrong direction, they can intervene sooner, adjust their care plan with the goal of trying to prevent that hospital visit in the first place. So that is the remarkable potential of RPM, remote patient monitoring. Instead of missing appointments and doctors flying blind, this technology gives the opportunity for moms to get monitored in the home, simply like while catching up on Netflix, for example. And medical studies also reaffirm the value of RPM. In my written testimony that I sent a few days ago, I referenced close to 10 different studies that look at the value of RPM, um, both in maternal health care and, and for the broader population. But I wanted to focus in on one. A large North Carolina health system looked at over 3,200 pregnant moms who were on RPM. And the study uh, looked at 75% of those moms were on Medicaid, by the way. And the study results are extremely promising. Mr. Hoffman, if I could uh, interrupt you, I, um, your time is up there, but I'm, gonna, but I'm going to ask you uh, to briefly tell us about that study. So that will be my first question as, we, as your three minutes are up, but I will ask you the question to tell me more about the study. Mr. Hoffman, you're recognized. Sure. Thank you, Chairman Hawk. So the study looked at 3,200 pregnant moms and compared it with 3,200 moms who weren't on RPM. And the study showed that um, for the women who were using RPM in the home, there was a reduction in C-sections by over 30%, a reduction in preterm birth deliveries by over 22%. They detected preeclampsia earlier by 13 days on average, so you can see real health outcomes here. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments for Mr. Hoffman as we're out of session? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Very good insights. Thank you so much. Thank you much. for the opportunity. Uh, individuals from 10 Care. We do have Ms. Ashley Reed on the list from 10 Care. Ms. Reed, uh, once again, if you could please tell us who you are, who you're with, and the information you'd like to share, you are recognized. Thank you. Ashley Reed, Division of 10 Care. So 10 Care's primary concern, um, recognizing the importance and usefulness of RPM, is that there are several different places in this bill um, which wouldn't allow us to utilize our medical necessity criteria. I know the committee's familiar um, with, with our experience with, with medical necessity criteria um, and with the language in this bill bypassing that, um, you know, would really, you know, require us to, um, the different spots are um, when it's medically appropriate, high risk, um, a provider would be in the position of determining what counties are without OBs and also which pregnant moms lacked reliable transportation. Um, so those are things, you know, without the ability to monitor those from a 10 care perspective cause us concern. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Ms. Reed? Dr. Terry, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, is 10 Care still doing the patient-centered medical homes? I believe so. Mm -hmm. And I believe there was like a pilot program run through uh, one of the MCOs a few years ago dealing with some remote uh, treatment. Are you aware of, I mean, how would this be similar to what was done? Of course, the one previously, I think, was more encompassing than just uh, the population that we're looking at here, but how would that? I would need to go back and do research. I haven't looked at the PCMH in some time, but I will go back and do some research. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Ms. Reed, thank you very much. We will go back in session. Leader Camper, there we do have an untimely filed amendment. Is this uh, anything that you are wanting to go forward with? Uh, and I will 
For the benefit of the committee members, it is uh, tracking code 013812. Is this anything that you are hoping for consideration from the committee on? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, it is. It makes a minor uh, change. But what I was thinking, Mr. Chairman, because of the concerns I just heard from Tank here, uh, which I, I didn't know prior to, so I appreciate that uh, provision she spoke to. If I could roll this bill to the heel of this calendar and give me a chance to work with her, and if you're done, I can come, if your committee is done, I have a chance to, uh, for, for the amendment to be timely filed. Okay. So, but I mean, the amendment actually is just changing the word from and, from uh, and to or is what the amendment is doing okay. on the second page. We have heard the uh, the request of the sponsor, and, and we have precedent over the last hour and 15 minutes of, of doing just that. I will, uh, I'll leave it to the committee. I will take our advisement that we can, pa excuse me, roll item number 18, House Bill 1973, behind item number 24 on our calendar as we have as we have uh, rolled several bills this afternoon. I, I, I see no objection to that. So, uh, Lady Camper, we will we will acquiesce and we will roll. Item number 18, House Bill 1973, behind item number 24, 24 on the calendar without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. Thank you. All right, we are now ready for item number 19 on our calendar. It is... House Bill 2051 by Leader Love. Motion. We have a motion. We have a second. Leader Love, you are recognized to explain your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. We House. do have an amendment. Yes, uh, sir. Well, excuse me. It, it's an untimely filed amendment as well. I will uh, I'll let you explain the bill first, and then we'll uh, see what process we can go through. Uh, um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Later. So you recognize Leader Love. House Bill... 2051. Yes, sir. Uh, deals with postpartum, which is that time after childbirth uh, where women's bodies are getting used to uh, the body not being pregnant anymore. Childbirth occurs and adjustments have to be made. There was money put in the budget last year, I believe, which support a pilot program. And I will defer to the eloquent words you were speaking just a few minutes ago. Uh, as explanation also, this bill simply says that this program will go from being a pilot to being a uh, full program. And the amendment drafting code, I believe, Mr. Chairman, is 014780. And I thought we had filed that. I'm sorry. I thought we had filed that timely. We missed just by a little bit of getting it timely filed. Um, the committee has an opportunity to ask for a motion for consideration of the amendment code 014780, if it will make the bill. Motion. We have a motion to consider and a, mo and a second to consider uh, amendment 014780. If you could, is that essentially what the amendment does it, that you were explaining, or is this there amendment uh, is one that we worked on in consultation and cooperation with TenCare, adding wording that says that the person will be enrolled in the TenCare program, not only meeting eligibility but also being enrolled in the program to be part of the program. Okay, the motion is for consideration of. Amendment tracking code 014780. Are you ready to vote? All those in favor of allowing consideration of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. We are now under consideration of the amendment. Do I have a motion and a second on the amendment? Motion. We have a motion and a second on the amendment. 
You've given us a brief description of that, uh, Leader Love. All those in favor of attaching Amendment Number 014780 on House Bill 2051, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. We are on your bill as amended, and we'll let you continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me extend my thanks to now Senator Lamar uh, for asking me to carry this legislation that she was carrying. And I thank TenCare for their help also in helping get this amendment fixed so it was more acceptable. And Mr. Chairman, I renew my motion. And, and once again, we are in the midst of a pilot program and understand where we are and, yes, and what we've been able to, to conduct on uh, uh, with that and, and seen some success. So excited to see what the fruits of our labor will be there. Uh, any questions or comments for Leader Love? Okay. Are you ready to vote? All right. All those who are in favor of sending House Bill 2051 to full insurance committee, please signify by saying aye. Any of those opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. You move forward, Leader Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you. Leader Love, you do have item number 20 on our calendar as well. It is item number 2109. Mr. Chairman, if, if there is just a wee bit more space behind item 24... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the the request has been to roll item number 20, House Bill 2109, behind item number 24 on our calendar. Seeing no objection, <laughs> so so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Take a little bit of personal privilege here. As we go to item number 21 on our calendar as well, um, is item number 2851 by Chairman Dr. Kumar. I think the request will be to roll this bill as well. Um, I have a, uh, have a request that we roll this bill behind item number 24. Uh, Chairman Dr. Terry, you're recognized. Is this on item number 22? Not yet. Okay. Not, okay. Okay, forgive me, we were offline there for a moment. Uh, that, that is not uh, the request on, on item number 29. Excuse me, item number 21. I've just misspoke twice today, so. On item number 29, House Bill 2851, Chairman Dr. Kumar, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as life is, we are all products of a genetic lottery. And we inherit certain things over which we have no control. Considering those circumstances when we are faced with buying insurance, our genetic uh, susceptibility to certain conditions over which, again, we had no control can play an important role. In, in our state, we do have a statute that prohibits insurance companies from using the genetic information to deny or, or uh, increase coverage for health insurance. This bill adds life insurance as well as long-term care insurance to the same uh, statute. Uh, to it is a matter of privacy. It is a matter of fairness. Again, the genetic lottery over which we have no control, and it is also a matter of uh, uh, freedom. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll renew my motion. Thank you. And just. Make sure I'm, I'm certain I heard a motion in a second on, on the legislation. So, yes, we did. Uh, motion in a second on House Bill 2851. Any questions or comments for Chairman Dr. Kumar? Questions called. Are you ready to vote? 
All those in favor of sending House Bill 2851 to full insurance committee, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. The bill moves forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We are now on item number 22 on our calendar, House Bill 876 by Dr. Chairman Dr. Terry. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And it was my intent to uh, have an amendment for this bill that would have DCI look into a 1332 waiver. But as, as I've tried that before and it had a fiscal note, and my understanding is that uh, Georgia is in a lawsuit over something like that. So with that going on, I would like to take this off notice. Okay. <laughs> The request of the sponsor has been to take off notice. Seeing no objection, House Bill 876 is off notice. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a posture where I believe we've done all the work that we're going to be able to do today. The, uh, the time is upon us to, to, uh, to adjourn the committee. Um, hearing a motion and a second to adjourn. We are adjourned.